Um, thank you. Great to be here. Um, it's customary at the Wheeler Centre to begin with uh, a statement of respect to Aboriginal culture, but Bob and I thought we might do it a bit differently tonight rather than repeat the same formula of words. So I'm just going to start by saying to you, Bob, Australian footy is our great athletic invention. It's sort of like our equivalent to jazz, I like to think. Um, what is it Aboriginal players have brought to Australian football, in your opinion? Uh, thank you for having me, everyone. And Flan is always a pleasure. Um, a lot, in a, in a short sentence, a lot. But the, the Indigenous players that I played on, the, the very best of them, uh, you always got a, a sense early on that it felt like, I felt like I and... and and the other white fellas on the field, we were, you're trying to always tune into a game of football. It's, a, it's got a certain frequency and you're trying to tune into it. And I always felt like that players like myself, were tr we were trying to find the sheet music and that the great Indigenous players were playing it by ear. That's what it, that's what it sort of felt how, like. How good's that? <laughs> Off the top of his head. Um, now, you played on some of the greats. Um, just say a few words to me about Cyril. He's not here, is he? He's not chasing me. <laughs> He's not chasing me again, is he? Uh, I've told you this before, um, but uh, C Cyril's the only um, Cyril's the only player I I ever played against who who I was conscious of when I had the ball. Um, my my favourite thing to do on the footy field was to to get the ball at half back and run through the middle of the ground and sort of you know look at the options and try and slice the opposition open. It's kind of a, a singular thought of what damage can I do to the other team? But when we were playing Hawthorne, it was always, it was always, it was in the front of my mind of, he's in the water. <laughs> Where is he? And you'd sort of, sort of scanning for, you know, the, the Bulldogs player, that was my second thought. The first one was, there's a dorsal fin with, <laughs> with, th with 33 on its back, <laughs> circling the waters. Because he was, he was, he was, he was a fierce, and powerful defensive tackler, which I think he, I think that sometimes gets underrated. You played on McLeod, Andrew McLeod. I tried to. <laughs> yeah, I, ch I chased my my job uh, one one day over in Adelaide was to to tag Andrew McLeod, and it didn't go well, Flanners. <laughs> but there there was a couple of moments. There was one moment where the ball was tumbling out to the wing, and we were both chasing it, and he took a left turn, a heartbeat before. I had even thought we, were we should have been turning and of course the ball bounces in his direction and he's gone. That's, that's what I mean about the playing it by ear where he, I, I'm chasing him but he, he's running away from me whilst watching the spin of the ball. Now if anyone's chased a spinning football before, it doesn't, it's, doesn't make a lot of sense. It's a chaotic thing and he, but he, he, he sort of instinctively knew it was going left before I did and there was another moment where he had the ball and he was running through the middle of the ground and he was bouncing the ball. Now I wasn't a lot of things on a footy field, Flanners, but I was pretty quick and I was chasing him and I know he was quick too but he's bouncing the ball so I should have been able to catch and he was going away from me and I, to this day I swear he turned back to me and grinned. <laughs> I've never, that's never happened on a football field. <laughs> To me, anyway. Um, goods, Adam Goods. Uh, the player or yep. the whatever. The, um, there's, the thing about most players is, you know, like like Cyril wasn't tall, so there there was that thing, you know, and, and Andrew McLeod wasn't. He was quite light, so but Goodsy was one of those. Um, he's one of those players. He kind of he could do anything. He could mm -hmm. he could do it all in any. Any conditions, he and he played in every position. So, when when it's, when someone is so gifted like that, they're tall, athletic, strong, creative. It's it's more a matter of what mood he was in, and what sort of, you know whether he was up for it. And, and whenever I saw him play, he was he was up for it. So he was to you know I, I didn't play on him thankfully, but who I know, I just know that whoever did always had a sense of dread. <laughs> Well, we're here tonight to celebrate the birth of Bob's book, the superbly titled Leather Soul. Um, I was honoured to be asked to write the foreword to that. It's not too long and I'm just going to read it simply because it's the best it best expresses what I feel about Bob as a writer. 
So here we go. George Bernard Shaw famously declared, those who can do, those who can't teach. In sport, this generally translates as those who can play, those who can play, those who can't write about it. So in talking about a new book to do with sport, it is important to note that there is not one tradition of sports writing, but two. The first and most common tradition is that of the observer, the hopefully well-informed spectator. In sports writing, as in all non-fiction writing, it is crucial for the writer to know and identify where they sit in relation to their subject. As the great American photographer Ansel Adams said of his art, a good photograph is about knowing where to stand. Years ago, I had a difference of opinion with a, co with a colleague about whether journalists are, not, are entitled to question the courage of AFL players. She said courage was part of the game. Therefore, writers had the right to comment on whether or not they believed individual players possessed it. I am fundamentally opposed to that view. I've twice seen my wife give birth. I know what it looks like, but I'm not going to say I know what it feels like. <laughs> Sports writers in this first tradition are people with a practised eye, informed by what they are told by the participants, but essentially remaining spectators. The great sports writers in this tradition know that. It's part of the fidelity, the precision of their art. The second, much rarer category of sports writers is players or athletes who also happen to be writers. No one can define good writing, but one important attribute is clearly originality, both of perspective and of expression. It has something to do with putting life on the page in the same way that artists do when they sketch a likeness. American runner Kenny Moore, English cricketer Peter Roebuck, Irish soccer player Eamon Dunphy, Australian footballer Brent Croswell, and Australian boxer Misha Mertz are notable examples of athletes who are also writers. Doubly gifted, these individuals have the ability to convey what happens in their sports in a way that takes you beyond appearances, beyond speculation, into the internal world of the participant or performer. The difference between the two traditions can be as great as the difference between a simple account of a small girl sitting beside a tree talking to herself and Alice in Wonderland. Leather Soul stands squarely in this second tradition of sports writing. For as long as I have known Bob Murphy, he has been wholly original in his perceptions and the way that he expresses them. He is as natural in this as he was in the way he played the game. One of my favourite quotes about art comes from jazz great Duke Ellington. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Bob's writing has swing, though I wouldn't necessarily liken it to jazz. He puts me more in mind of an Irish tin whistle player. In an important and necessary sense, his writing is simple. He has that immediately recognisable individual quality that the Irish call voice. Consistent with this is the fact he's always going his own way, over the hills and far away, illustrating a lot of what he has to say with insights into Australia's national game and the people who populate it. As a player, he had superb balance. So too as a writer. Balance in knowing that the game has a hard edge. No one writes better about fear, but never in a way that coarsens his perceptions of his fellow players. Balance in seeing deep into the game while knowing at the same time it's only a game. He's poignant, he's light, he's serious, he's bright. He's going his own merry way, providing a view you won't get anywhere else. I'm here to tell you there is only one Bob Murphy. So that was uh, what I wrote as my... <laughs> <clears throat> so just, as I understand, having talked to you about this, Bob, you didn't have the aspiration to be a writer. No, nope. Um, no, not at all, actually. Um, Dad was a librarian. There was books in the house. We, you know, there was always books around. Um, but my eye was on, um, from a young age, I was going to be a footy player. Just, no. <laughs> school. <laughs> Don't need school. Going to be a footy player. And uh, started that. But I, but I was restless in the, in the football. Thing. I was, you know, got what I wanted and then... Uh, you know, it was, but I found myself restless in the confines of a professional footy environment and our footy manager at the time, somehow the word got through that the age were looking for a player to be a, a columnist and 
So, so the legend goes, actually. I've, this has never been verified, but the, the story I was told was that 11 players had turned it down. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was the 12th. And with about as much thought as a hiccup, I said, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. With, with no regard for what that really entailed for any journalist students in the room, I can't imagine that will, that story will make you very happy about just sort of stump. Yeah, I'll write for the Age for a weekly column, no worries. But that that's that's sort of what happened, and I I had to sort of learn on the go that I had no real formal training. It was the first thing I'd written since school, and what I had written in school was pretty pretty basic. Um, but I didn't want it to be ghost written either, which I I now look back almost surprised at that. But I, I wanted to write it myself for better or worse, and and sort of you know all those. All those sort of early mistakes were out there for the world to see, and but I, I, I quickly became sort of you know addicted to it. And over the years, I mean, I remember meeting you once, and you were in a readers' group, um, a book club, a book club. Uh, Matthew Pavlich. Yeah, we, he was a late recruit to it because he was <laughs> he was he'd become jealous of it. But yeah, Chris Bond, who was a, a coach at the Bulldogs, yep. and Daniel Giants, accuser, and myself, we sort of created this book club and Chris Bonded, he'd gone to Fremantle so that was a, sort of just a way of, of the three of us sort of keeping in touch and we started off boldly, we had you know, six books in the first year and as these things tend to go, it was four books the next year, <laughs> two books, one of which none of us read <laughs> and now it's about one every three years I think, it's just sort of just, just sort of spluttering along. So what would be your favourite sports book? Uh, my favourite sports book would probably be The Secret Race by the, um, the cyclist Tyler Hamilton. Um, cycling's not a, not a sport I knew anything. Oh, I, n apart from, you know, we would watch it. I would, dad, mum and dad would put it on but more to watch the French countryside than follow the, um, follow the peloton. Uh, so I knew nothing about it, but sort of just had a sort of vague interest in it. And the, the book took me into that world, very specifically of the places, um, of the... I, 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 I could feel the gristle of the pain and what they endure, and that I, I really liked that. And I thought, um, there, you know, in small ways, that was some inspiration for, for, for this book of wanting to get wanting to feel those, the bumps and the bruises and, and the, the loneliness and the darker side to it. Yeah. One of my frustrations with, um, with writing about footballers is um, if, if, if you ever ask them, you know, what's the best thing about the game, they'll go winning or, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> being with your mates. Um, and I love the game. And, um, you know, they, they, they can never that so many of them can never, ever give you insights of the sort I desire into the game. And the great Peter Dacos said to me once, um, the mistake journalists make is that they always think that footballers think about what they do, whereas in fact, a lot of what they do, they do because they don't think about it, which doesn't make them that different from artists and other people. But what I love about well, one of the qualities in Bob's writing that I love about is he takes me inside, inside the game and inside what it feels like to play the game. And probably Brent Croswell's the last footy writer that did it for me as powerfully as he does it. So I'm going to ask you, Bob, can you read me a piece um, from your book about a, a sublime moment that you had playing footy? I can. <laughs> I just so happen to have my book right here. <laughs> Open at the page. <laughs> Flagged at the page. Uh, I'll, I'll just quickly say this, of all the things I had to write about, people might think, oh, you know, the writing about the grand final and all, that must have been really difficult. That actually was not, not as difficult as this, but I thought for a book full of sort of darker, self-deprecating kind of... This, this was hard because it was sort of thought, I'm just going to have a try to write a moment where something just went perfectly right. So here's my attempt at that. It's the Western Bulldogs versus GWS 12 minute mark of the second quarter. Marcus Bontempelli bursts clear from a stoppage on the half forward flank and spears a pass to a leading Jack Redpath. As soon as the ball leaves the Bont's book, boot, I can tell he's put too much on it. 
Big Red is six foot four or 193 centimetres for the young kids, but instinctively I feel like it'll go over his head, so I make my move. I sprint as fast as I can to the open side of the ground as the ball flies past Red's outstretched hands. The GWS player Harrison Himmelberg is quick and I can feel him breathing down my neck as the ball bounces away from us at pace towards the boundary line. I love this situation. There's lots of things I can't do on a footy field, a list that grows by the day when you get to my age. But I love this scenario. I love this stage, confined space, opponent on my tail, the ball not yet in my possession. In days gone by, I would have known I was about to evade my man, but it's been a while. I can't get space with pure leg speed, so I slow down. This is something many people don't realise. Sometimes the best way to get away is to slow down first and then go. It's the change in speed and direction at precisely the same moment that makes someone difficult to tackle. I can control both of our movements now. It's like a dance and I'm leading. Everything is frame by frame, slow motion, moment by moment. I shift down a gear, feel him just on my back. There's only a breath of air between painful embarrassment and my football freedom. I take possession and shake my hips. I give him the shimmy. I take him one way, then the other, then the other. Left, right, left, in a split second with every bit of juice I've got in my body. He lunges, he's close, but I've put just enough space between us to wriggle free. I turn for the pocket. There's no space there, which is why it's the right spot. Maybe, just maybe, Himmelberg assumed I'd turn for space and safer ground, but I didn't. I look up over my shoulder and see the goal face. It's tight and closing, but something just feels right tonight. The rhythm of the play, the rhythm of my legs, the universe all pulling it together. My last thought, if you could call it that, is balance. I hold the ball softly, swing my leg through and try not to kick it too hard. The contact is sweet, as sweet as Mark War flicking through mid-wicket. I know it's a goal as it leaves my boot. It's the most exhilarating feeling I've ever known. A clean, crisp, musical note. It might never feel this perfect again. The ball spins and arcs through the middle and it's enough to bring people to their feet. My momentum carries me towards the fence and before me is a sea of red, white and blue. The clan, my clan, they feel what I feel. We are one and the same for a brief moment in space and time. I drag my fists back and forth from them to me and back again. I want them to know I feel the connection too. One last time. Our good set. When you were reading. Oh, did I? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've also appreciated about your writing is, um, you know, fear is a, an element of the game. And um, I think you write better about fear than anyone in footy than anyone I've read. Um, why, how, how was it that you came up with the idea of writing about that? Or um, Because I don't think... Well, p players, are, players are instinctively uncomfortable talking about fear because if they talk about fear, they have to admit they have fear and that, that is the great sin of footballers or that's the perceived thing to avoid. You know, I, I, the, the, the Brad Sewell once wrote in, in, in the Age newspaper, a player's greatest fear is to show fear itself and that, that, is, that is so true. But yet then, so no, no players will talk about it or... But then occasionally they say, oh, we've all, but we've all felt it. We've all, and we've all had a moment we regret where, you know, we've flinched. And as soon as I, you know, those little taboo things, I thought, well, that, that'd be interesting to write about because no one, no one, you know, no one has. Um, and so much of um, the football commentary from players are of the great players. The, the, so they, I kind of have this thing of, the, the champions in the game talk about the game from the perspective of after they've become, after they've won, after they've accomplished everything, where I think the, the part of the game that I think is the truest, the, the, the essence of it, is the, is the moments before the game when there's doubt and there's, you know, you're looking over the precipice and it's the unknown of what will happen. I think that's the, that's the pure bit, not the bit after the fact when you've won and you can sort of then preach to the world about what you did. So I kind of like those little moments where you can shine a light that we don't, we don't really talk about. 
You, you said to me once that um, your favourite part of the game is, in fact, before it starts. Yeah, what that, the, the, uh, the two hours, the morning of a game and, the, and the, the two hours before a game were hell for me. And I, I know other people, it's that the sick feeling in your stomach because you are, you are putting your reputation out to be judged again. You're putting in the reputation of yourself and your club and it's all on the line. No matter what you've, no matter what you've done, or where the clubs are, all that, it's it's all got to go on the line again. And that's that's a heavy burden to every week. And so every week you front up, put all your chips on the table, and there's moments where you think, what, why have the, why have my the decisions in my life gotten to this point? Why have I chosen this as my as my job? But then you would run out onto the ground, and it would all it would all go away. And then you would come together with those players, hold on to one another. And then you're not talking analytics. You're not talking about the spare defender and what they're going to do and how many the kick to handball ratio is. That talk is out. That's not. That's all been during the week. You come together and talk matters of the heart and of symbolism of the jumper and the colours and what it means to us and why we're different from those guys over there. And that's it. And most of it's an illusion or a delusion. I'm not sure which, but. <laughs> Because you know they're just another bunch of footballers, really. But at that moment, it's the most important thing in the history of the universe, and we are different to any other football team that's ever, ever entered a football field. That's how it feels. That's the that's the that's the good stuff. Now I look back on it now, going, "Gee, that was a bit of a carry-on," but <laughs> but that's kind that was kind of the delusion you it needed to be, or needed to be for me anyway. Well. That is why I think it was a very dangerous idea that the AFL had of trialling experimental games during the season because popular sports do rest on certain illusions and if you muck around with those illusions you can really damage the sport and one of them is the high seriousness of these contests and if you suddenly make them experiments um, you are taking them to a different status. Uh, so that was why I thought it was a, a very dangerous idea they had, one of a number. Um, <laughs> now, another lovely part in your book, Bob, you know, there's, there's the sublime moment of kicking the goal with the player on your tail, and then there's the moment when you realise it's over. Yeah, which is the next week. That's kind of the... <laughs> that's how I sort of quick... But, I mean, to give it context, I'd, I'd already retired... I knew it was my last year, I'd sort of, but that was almost as a, an emotional thing. I'd, I'd just gotten to the end, I, I couldn't face it. But I did, have this, I did have this feeling that I could probably get through another few games or I could do another pre-season, but I, I couldn't get through another winter. There's no, I couldn't do it and I didn't want to do it. I just sort of, but there's a game we played, the boys just played on the weekend, but we played um, Port Adelaide in Ballarat on a cold, shitty day. And I woke up with the sniffles and it didn't go well. I can't find much space and I'm frustrated. Every chance I get, I take the opportunity to pick a fight with a Port Adelaide defender trying to psych them out. It's a pretty childish pursuit. At one point the game opens up and I've Port defended Tom Jonas offside. Matt Suckling kicks the ball out in front of us. More like, a soccer more like a soccer style through ball than a pass. I take off after it and get excited that I might be able to ignite something in the game. The crowd rises with excitement too. But as I take possession, Jonas brings me down immediately with a good tackle. Genuinely surprised that he was able to keep up with me in the open field, we scrap it out onto the ground and I knock the ball out to a teammate. As I'm lying down watching the footy pinball between players, Jonas rubs the back of my head, pressing my face into the ground. I see red. As the play leaves our area, we jog after it, but I'm seething and the Bulldog supporters behind us know it. I feel the alien urge to throw a punch at him. I've never felt that in my entire football career. So why now? The disturbing truth is it's because I'm embarrassed. The game has passed me by. I'm out of tricks. I'm desperate. Is there a particular game that stands out for you, you know, over your 15 or 16 years? Is there, a, is there one game that stands out as being more meaningful than any of the others? Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty clearly the, the 
we, this, the, the game we beat Sydney in 2015, round five, I think it was. So Bevo had been our coach for six months, but we were still sort of, um, you know, still falling in love, I guess, as, as coach and, and players. We didn't know if we were any good. We probably all had a suspicion that we weren't going to be very good that season. But we were starting to play some good footy. We go up to Sydney and we play them in the wet and they're, they're a great side with the best player in the league in Buddy and go, we go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the great teams of the modern era. Goes down to the wire and we beat them by a couple of points and it's a, it's a classic game. And we came off the ground and a bit like what you alluded to before about players not being able to express in words how they feel. So what we're all doing, we're just holding on to one another. And then we get to sing our song and we sing our song. And I've never seen our sung song, our song sung <laughs> like that before or since where it was, the circle was moving. It was like a mosh pit. We were sort of holding on to each other and it was swaying and jolting and moving because it was the only thing we knew what to do yeah. because of this something was awakening in us. And then we go into the rooms of the, of the change rooms and we're all sort of waiting for our, you know, our coach, this football Moses character <laughs> who seems to have the tablets and all the answers. <laughs> and we're, we're sitting there and we're you know, breathing heavily and you know, guys are still hanging on to one another. We're waiting for him to speak and to tell us, make sense of it all. And the context of that is up until then, and I'd played for 15 years, and the, the most sort of emotion or um, congratulations you usually got from a coach was a sort of bit of a restrained sort of, you know, pat on the back as you were stretching down. That was kind of like the sun coming out on a spring day. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> Patted me on the back. And uh, anyway, we, but we sit there in the change rooms and we sit there for a, a, a minute, a minute of silence, which is a long, long time to sit in silence and then Luke got up and he, he couldn't compose himself, he was trying to hold back tears and he still stood there for quite a while until he eventually said that he's proud of us and that's all he could sort of get out with, without breaking down and from, oh, that took my breath away. I think football, you know, we're, we're, you're getting a bit of a sense, we're pretty basic creatures, footballers, <coughs> but one of... If you boil it down, we, we, we do the things we do. We put our bodies on the line. We sort of push ourselves to this level to make other people proud. But most of the time, it's to make your coach proud. And when it's good, it's definitely to make your coach proud. So for him to tell us that we'd made him proud, it doesn't... Now that I look back over the whole thing, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't surprise me at all that 18 months later, we win a grand final against the Sydney Swans. It was, and that's with the greatest respect to the Sydney Swans, but I think so much of what, ha what eventually happened could be traced back to those, his tears. Wow. Um, if you had had a career and never been a captain, but you'd played more than 300 games, what would you have missed out on? Um... I foolishly told Jared Waitley one night, he interviewed me for something and I said, this is before I was captain, I said, oh, I think I've had the full football experience and thought, well, look back on that, though, that's a, what a cock up that is because, <laughs> because the captaincy just, it, it, it magnified the whole experience. Um, it, it just made every moment feel important where sometimes you felt like you, there were things you had to do and you ticked the box and... Whereas when you, when you were captain, everything felt significant. And the, one of the things I loved about it was all the mistakes I'd made over that time suddenly became, suddenly became like almost little secret weapons yeah. of I don't, I see these young men, these young players coming into the game and with a lot of them I saw a likeness in them and thought I, I can see what, where you're going wrong, yeah. I know what you're going through, I know what you're anxious about. I experienced that, and you could, I could feel it help them. Um, so that, that, be, and I, that, you know, I got to, I got to sort of just stretch out the last few years because I got to play under a coach that I'd all, you know, that kind of a coach, and a special group of players, and and got to, got to re-emphasise the things I love about the game. That um, there's there's a lot of footy that there's just things that have to be done. There's the professional side and the analytical side and all that stuff that 
but the stuff I love is the storytelling and the symbology and the the lineage of you know. So the first I get I become captain. The first thing oh, I want to get Terry Wheeler to come back and talk to the players about what it means to be a Bulldogs player because because I think it's important and I think that players need I think it nourishes them to to hear the story of their club and the significance of it and 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 again whether it's an illusion or a delusion or whether it's fact, you I, you need it to feel different to every other club. Whether you are or not, that's for other people to argue, but it was always more fun and more enjoyable for me when I felt like what we were doing was different to everyone else. If you had um, one story um, that, that summed up your experience of being captain, one story that's special to you about your time as captain... Um, well, it was always a balance of – it took me 15 years to build up the courage to step forward in terms of the leadership thing say, I'm a leader, I want to be the captain. That took a long time for me to do. And then once, once I became captain, then you sp I spent the next three years of trying to work out the balance of when it is time to step forward and when it is time to let someone else. So that was – that was kind of the, the trick of it. But the, there was one moment, when, you know, and Jordan Roughhead comes up to me before a game and says, I think you should wear Adam Goods' number 37 for the oh, yeah. toss of the coin today. Yeah. And I remember thinking, that's a good idea. That's a really beautiful symbol of something to do that cuts through a lot of the, a lot of the white noise. So, you know, I mean, I'm the captain. I have to do it. It's, it's, it's on me and there's the photo of me, but it's, but it's Jordan Roughhead's idea. Yeah. But I like to think it's Jordan Roughhead's idea too, because of the way I was a captain. So it's a yeah. it was a it was a partnership of, yeah. and it represented the feeling amongst the locker room. Yeah. Well, I I was um, today interviewed by a film crew um, for a documentary about about Adam Goods that's going to be shown in in Australia, but in other countries as well. And um, the thing I tried to say to them was that. I believed at the time when the booing was going on that the only people who could stop it were the players. And, um, you know, there were all these pious calls for the AFL to stop it as if the AFL were like a schoolmaster who could call in these people, like naughty kids, and tell them not to do it anymore. Um, that wasn't going to happen. Um, they weren't going to be told by Gil McLaughlin not to do it. They weren't going to be told by people like me not to do it. We were what is known now in America as the liberal mainstream press. Um, we were the enemy as far as those people were concerned. But I always felt the players, because ultimately footy is a player's game and the players are the people with respect. And um, I wrote that in The Age and you were the player who stood up um, and you wrote an article where you said that footy was a collision game and, um, and, and it involved blows, but what was happening to Goods each week were, quite blows to the soul. Um, and then I think it was that following Saturday that you wore that Guernsey. Yeah. Uh, so how did you feel at the time about doing that? Uh, I was just, I was, I, I know it had been happening for a few weeks, but I was at home watching, a, I think the game might have been in, in Perth and heard the boos and it, 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 it was... It was painful for me as someone who doesn't know Adam. I didn't know Adam, um, and I'm not an Indigenous man. But it was—I found it really hurtful. And so then you, be, you know, they get that sort of, you get that restlessness of what, what can we do? What can? And then, but at the Bulldogs, we also had the added thing of Brett Goods played with us, and you get to know people. In you know, when you play footy with someone and you spend every day with them, those you notice subtle changes in them. And he was. It was almost like a grief that he was experiencing, and it yeah. just so for us we could there were, we could touch it I think and and feel the pain more than what a lot of other players, and that's still once removed. It's it's, it's his brother who lives a long way away, and so I thought, well, you know, I'll write a write a column about it, and that, but even I mean, the, you write a column, but he's sort of, you know, it's out there, and there you go. But what does it? What does it really? What does it really achieve? And then. When yeah, when Jordan said, "Why don't we do that?" and the, the the part about it that I loved, you know, whatever whatever you think of Adam Goods, he's a master of symbolism, and so it was an homage to that as much as the yeah. the, the cause itself that 
it's um, it was, yeah, just a, a tribute to him, and you know, and the the thought behind it was, you if you boo him, you boo all of us. That's so right. I, we just wanted him to know that we would stand with him. Right. Have you ever seen him since? No. Okay. No. Um, I think a question a lot of people here tonight would like to hear your thoughts on. Uh, the dogs won it in two thousand and sixteen. Utter sporting magic by any standards anywhere in the world. Um, why did they win it? And oh, <laughs> and why did the magic disappear? Uh, I don't know. I don't know why we won it. And the frustration is that now, now after the fact, where it, that that team is being dissected of um, the age demographics and the. The positional changes and who's it was like the team. The team was not on paper, and we knew that. But we, it was something. It was something we felt. It was. It was very much, very much from the gut and alchemy. I suppose is the is the word of. Um, and you, you know, the title of your book, A Wink from the Universe, as soon as you told me what the title was, I was like, that's it. That's what it felt, and that's what it felt like at the time. Um, a special, mad, mad bunch of players. They really are as mad as a box of frogs that got those guys <laughs> hard to kind of control. But it wasn't an unsophisticated football program, but it was an uncomplicated team and I think part of it you know with the, the long you know 62 years I think that if it had been an older more experienced team I think it would have that might have played on the minds of you know and then you feel the you know there's, oh, there's a curse out to get us and it could all go wrong this young bunch of players they didn't give a shit about any of that they had a healthy disregard for any of that stuff seven prelims I don't care we didn't play it's got nothing to do with us <laughs> And I, I remember in grand final week, that, which was another part of the lesson of me being the captain, it was, it was me standing back and not saying too much because I would have been like, ah, I started to rant and rave and we 62 years. <laughs> I was sort of sitting back and I'm watching these boys go, get ready for training like, oh, what time's the game? Saturday, 2 o'clock? Yeah, we'll be there. It was like, I'm so, like, wow, they've got no idea what's... They had a healthy disregard for that. But it was just a, it was just a special... It was just a special time and a special group of players that just just hit on something that was from the gut. All right, mate. Well, perhaps you'd like to give us another reading from the last part of your book, which is you reflecting back on your career. Yep. And you've got six minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> There was a theory put to me that the overarching theme of this book would only emerge once it was almost complete, and I now believe that to be true. Looking back over these pages, I see many arcs, a bit like chopping down a gum tree to find the rings in the timber, spheres of time, innocence arching all the way around to experience, a few knots of imperfection for good measure. If my childhood and upbringing were easy, my football career was anything but. Every team, every player in the league is always trying to prove a point, and I suppose I was trying to prove that I could endure. Was I tough enough? I've always been a fan of the great players. I got to play with so many, but Chris Grant and Marcus Bontempelli stand out. Complete players, stars. That's something to tell the grandkids. For all of the nonsense in the analysis of the game, most of us still acknowledge that the special ones move differently. Something in the nuances of their play sets them apart from the rest of us. Granny's ability to pick up the flight of the ball in the air and mark it in front of his eyes with perfect timing, with danger all around, always left me feeling lucky to have such a close vantage point. Watching the Bont create a path in the chaos of play with his big frame has already become a trademark. Playing alongside him, I could hear the appreciation in the outer from our own supporters. It was even more graceful from a few feet away. With the ball in his hands, he'd lope away in slow motion like he was wading through waist-deep water, the sea of stragglers falling away in his wake, one by one. A football Moses, or Jesus, definitely biblical. <laughs> I described the 2016 Premiership and that medal moment with Bevo as, like, as being like a mountain in my life. 
but just like Uluru, the colour of the mountain changes in the light. On most days, I see a beautiful landscape, a football fairy tale rising out of the ground to pointing towards the heavens. But there are other days too. There are times when just the memory of that day and that moment break my heart in two. Even now, I still brace myself when a stranger starts up a conversation with me about the premiership or the medal. I'm scared of what they might say. It all depends on the shade of the mountain on that day. A memoir like this demands a level of candour. It's only recently I've come to accept that my greatest day in football was grand final day 2016. But I must also acknowledge that my worst day in football was the very same day. As a leader of this club, at that time, I was so proud. The euphoria was so real. But I'm also a footballer, and on that day I was not where I was meant to be. I felt that in my marrow. I will never get over it. For a time, almost was another title option, but its black humour might have been too obscure. On those blue days, it helps to remind myself that despite the twinges of heartache, they are nothing compared to that sense of being unfulfilled in 2014. I sit back now knowing that at least it meant something. We're now going to uh, call for questions and people, I understand, are in the auditorium with um, microphones. So we can't see you, we're just going to hear voices coming at us. Okay, Bob. <clears throat> just like to say two words. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I'd just like to thank you both for tonight and also ask a question a little bit off topic, I think, but because the reason I know you is because you both wrote, wrote and write for The Age. Just wondering what your feelings are about the... Um, I was going to say merger, but I don't think it is. The, the disappearance, at least, of the name of Fairfax. Um, I could weep. Um, I had 32 years at The Age and... They were, I, I, they were just 32 most wonderful years. Journalism's great because it makes you go places you'd never otherwise go and meet people you'd never otherwise meet. Melbourne's a great city. It's got a heart and a mind. And the age put me right into sync with that. Um, and I genuinely, honestly believe that while there's trash journalism and cheap journalism and shit journalism, Good journalism is as important as the air we breathe. And I'm proud of journalists, you know, 80 a year get murdered around the world because they get too close to the truth. Hundreds are put into prison. Um, and the death of quality media means that we end up being run by extreme, you know, a few extremely wealthy individuals um, who, who then dictate politics accordingly. So I think it's a really... Sad day, and uh, if I have one message to you, fight for the ABC. Stand up, get out on the streets. It's going to take that. A, a bit like, um, a bit like Muhammad Ali when he fought George Foreman, and he, George was going down, and Muhammad cocked his fist, and he said, "But I just didn't want to ruin the moment with a clumsy punch as he went down." I'd say the same about what Martin just said right there. I don't want to, I don't want to throw a clumsy verbal punch when that was. <laughs> Note perfect, mate. <laughs> Hello. Oh, Bob, uh, congratulations on the book, uh, the Thank title, um, uh, Leather, Leather Soul. Is that, I'm a big music fan and a great footy fan too. Is that the Beatles and footy combined into one? Yeah, it's a bit of, it's a, it's, it's kind of a choose your own adventure title, but <laughs> there's a little nod to the, to the Beatles there with, with Rubber Soul. There's the obvious football leather, football soul being a part of being a part of me and it's just a little bit pretentious and I could have liked that as well. Hi. Football, is it just a game? No. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a delusion, but I think it's a glorious sort of delusion mm. that, um, we well, you know, really, in the end, it doesn't really matter, but 
when your team's in a close game and it's in the last couple of minutes, does it feel like it doesn't really matter? <laughs> no. So, so I guess it, I guess it can be both, but it's more, isn't it? Well, to me, it's um, yeah, it's it's a game and it's not a game. And um, my grandfather couldn't write more than his name, and um, he was the president of the Cleveland Footy Club, and my father's. Uh, footy stories, because he was born in 1914 and his footy, early footy stories are all about how Cleveland can't get a team because too many of the young men haven't come back from World War I. And, um, my grandfather only went to Hobart once um, and that was to see Ivor Warren Smith lead the North West Football Union against the TFL. Um, and that story comes down to me 60 years later with a scoreline. And, um, my mother's family, they were musical people but they had a farm up the back of Devonport and one of the clan was dying. He was a young man, he was only 20. And his brother went to the local grand final with two pigeons, one to send home a score at half time, one to send home a score when the game was over. So for me, Australian football's just a treasury of stories. And I drove from Melbourne to Darwin with Michael Long. It's a phenomenal experience to cross this great continent with someone who's known every time he steps out of the car. That's by workers, you know, blue-shirted workers, by a bloke driving a, a grader in the middle of the desert, by a half-pissed bank clerk coming back from a Christmas party, by some traditional Aboriginal people whose car's broken down beside the road. Um, I've had, you know, I've had so many wonderful experiences out of footy. Uh, I got a letter once from an American, and he said, I've been living in this city for some years. You are obviously an intelligent man. Why do you write so much about football? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, because it's the culture I'm from. It's where I'm from. And I've just always understood it. And that's why it meant a lot to me to dedicate the book I wrote on the Bulldogs premiership to Pat and Jenny Hodgson, because they were these mother and daughter. When I wrote my first book on the dogs in 93, they were there every night at training. And I used to sit with them and watch training. And, um, you know, that was just, you know, they were footy people and I'm a footy person. I like being around footy clubs. I, I just love it. And, um, yeah, I, my world would certainly be a poorer world without it. Um, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Martin. A fantastic night. Um, Bob, running down the race out of the Witten stand is one of the best things you can ever do with a red, white and blue one. I know I've shared that with you in different eras. But given Martin's comments about Tasmania, will you put your hand up as the first coach of a Tasmanian <laughs> side? <laughs> I take that as a great compliment. <laughs> but as, uh, I think they would want some tactics. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> we, we, may, we may need to call in some decent assistant coaches. <laughs> There's only so many times you can go to the well on the jumper and the song and we've got our people there and we're going to shove it up them. <laughs> yeah, we may need to have some kind of structure to this thing. <laughs> That's right. Wow, imagine you and I in charge, fellas. <laughs> Jeez. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> be good. Be good. Be a good social club. <laughs> Gents, uh, I'm down the back here with some very proud Bulldog supporters. Because every time you say something, there's ooh, uh, ooh. Uh. The person who asked about the game, uh, first of October, two sixteen, Liam Pickin takes a mark in the goal square, kicks the goal, and there's this euphoric. We've there, we've won. That tells you about the game. Bob, I watched the Outsiders last night and one of the really good points I thought you raised about memberships was you said that the Bulldogs weren't the greatest members but every time you drive around a car, there's a Bulldog sticker on a car. So we had the most number of stickers on cars. I thought that was great. <laughs> Mate, your friend up there asked you the question about why is the magic gone? I'd like you to answer that. <laughs> It's an easy one. Uh, I, I don't know why, um, but it, it, something definitely, it just, something felt different, something felt different after the premiership. Not, not anything obvious, nothing you sort of feel like you can touch, but 
The thing I get the shits with is when people say, oh, you know, the, the Bulldogs premiership hangover. It's like, that's not, that's such a throwaway, easy sort of, you know, it's got a nice little bow on it and oh, it's premiership hangover. It's like, it's a, it's a change in identity. That's a, that's a big thing to go through. And I think it affected everyone. So the, the Bulldogs after 2016 are now redefining who we are. Um, that, that's pretty heavy stuff. That's pretty heavy stuff. So the, when, you, when, you, when, you join, when you walk into a football club or when you join a football club, you take on its culture and baggage. and when, So when I got to the Bulldogs and when all the young players of my era came through, you felt the heaviness of the Bulldogs, that, the, that our DNA was about survival and about dreaming of a, another premiership, but dreaming to yourself, really, and not something you, know, you would ever be sort of spoken about out loud all that much. And I'm supporters exactly the same. You would kind of you sort of have those little daydreams. Where, what would that look like? What would that imagine? That, imagine that. I mean, but the the day to day was about about surviving. When we, when we win the premiership, um, it's not quite as dramatic, but it's a bit like if a greyhound around the greyhound track catches the rabbit, and then like, oh shit, <laughs> what now? So I think the the other analogy I use about premierships, Hawthorne, who win premierships regularly. They, they, they climb the mountain, they stick their flag in the top of the mountain and then they look for the next mountain, whereas for the Bulldogs it was like the moon landing and we get there before we thought we would and think, shit, it's a long way. Where are the, where's the next moon? So the challenge now is to, the challenge now is to become mountain climbers. So I think to call it a premiership hangover, is that, that just seems like, that doesn't seem, that seems a bit insincere to me that it, I think everyone had to navigate a, a difficult sort of transition, um, but but now people coming into the club now, there isn't the heaviness. There's an optimism and a it can be done and we will do it again. That's a that's a triumph. So the the short term pain at the moment is just re-establishing identity. This is just how I see it. Um, but yeah, let's uh, so the challenge is to go from astronauts to mountain climbers. <laughs> Thank you both for being here. Um, Bob, what do you think Luke Beveridge brought or brought out to the players? Uh, he brought an optimism and he, when, when he took over, we, we were a bruised club and a bruised playing group. Um, players who were used to losing, losing badly, um, and he took over and he brought... He, he, Luke's got a high level of football sophistication, tactically very sharp, but his tactical bent is also very optimistic and he, by nature, is very optimistic. So when he came in and told that playing group who were, as I describe it, very bruised and he said, we can be great, it, it was jarring. It was... and it, Maybe, you know, a hundred other people or a hundred other coaches could have told us that, but because Luke believed and believes in himself so much, you kind of went, oh, shit. If he, if he believes, he doesn't just sort of throw those things out there. Um, it made us feel really good and he was able to bring us together and then he balances out the football human battleships, the tactics and all that, with the human side of storytelling and and passion and symbolism and he's an eccentric and he allowed other people uh, other players to to sort of express themselves in different ways and took a bit of the tension out of the place and they were the you know the last three years of my footy career and there were some ups and downs in that but they were my favorite three years by a long long way um thank you both uh this evening um for your words and your writing in previous times um martin i remember in the week of the grand final, been in a toilet in Paris, reading an article that you wrote about the Bulldogs, and I went, this guy gets it, you know, gets it. Um, it was the only... That's high praise, Flannery. It was. 
Take a bit of beating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Bob, you're writing over the time in the early years when you were doing your column. Um, I didn't always get it, but it was nice to hear something that um, wasn't, yeah, we're going to see what happens next week. It goes one week at a time. It was nice to hear some poetry to it. Um, I go to the football these days to um, realise um, something, to go and get something out of the game. Um, when I barrack, um, I barrack very much like my dad. My dad is dead. So for me, I go to realise and listen to my dad. What do you go to the football for? What do you go to realise when you go to the football, whether it's playing or whether it's watching? Um, I, I've got to say, even you, even you just recalling your own um, feelings about it, R writing the book, I knew my dad would have a would have a strong influence in the book, in the memories, and I, I probably didn't realise just how many there would be, but, um, you know, Dad used to clean my boots every Friday night before I'd play junior football. Now, as a nine-year-old kid, ten-year-old kid, I didn't think anything of that. It's just, oh, Dad's cleaning my boots. And then, and it's only as I start writing the book and I start remembering things and think, oh, God. And, I, I, you know, I'd start to get emotional about about that and I, I saw... A, at Will Minson's wedding, Will's brother was cleaning his R.M. Williams boots before the ceremony with Dubbin and I nearly broke down because it just it reminded me of those the significance of those things. I, I'm i about the smells and the, and the sounds and the characters and the, the way the game kind of brings out the neuroses of ordinary sane people. <laughs> uh, I like that stuff, but there's, yeah, the, you know, the... the, the I don't eat donuts. I don't, you know, if you offered me one now, I don't really care for a donut. But I had a donut at the football <laughs> this year and I was transported straight back to, I was 11 years old and we're at Waverley Park and we're trying to find the car in the car park. And that was the... <laughs> because that was the tradition. It was nothing to do with the game. It was about on the way out, right, you, you, I must have, you know, the kids have... And we sat still for the entirety of the game, so we get a donut. That was our reward. <laughs> and we go, you know, in the sea of Commodores, <laughs> try, trying to find. So the taste of a jam donut is like time travel for me. Just to answer that question for me, um, in addition to the fact that I love the, the culture of the game, I love footy people, um, but I fell in love with footy as, a, as an 11 year old kid in a boarding school where I wasn't very happy or very connected to anything and um, in a culture where people hardly spoke or hardly said anything that seemed particularly meaningful. Um, and then we get out on the, the sports field and, and suddenly for me it, it was like some people discover theatre, like here was this place where people who otherwise didn't reveal themselves revealed themselves um, in ways that were comic in ways that were sometimes violent but there was also beauty out there and grace out there that I didn't see anywhere else and I, I was growing up in Burnie between the ages of 11 and 16 and five of the kids I played with or against came over and played in the in the VFL so the schoolboy footy was incredibly good so when I go to a game um, I've got to sit on the fence because I've got to feel the pace of the game and the power of the collisions and that's when I, that's when I, because what I admired as an 11 year old was the skill and the daring of the kids who could do what I didn't do and didn't dare to do. But I, I was in awe of it, it created wonderment in me and that's why I sit on the fence and that's what I want, I want to get, I want to appreciate the skill and daring of the players and then that takes me to another level and I start getting words. So. Pretty good note uh, to finish. Excuse me. I've got a question for Bob. It's about you mentioned in your reading the sort of your diminishing physical capabilities. <clears throat> and then when you retire... They've diminished even further. They, yeah. <laughs> well, I, guess that's, I guess that's what my question is, um, is about. So 15, 16 years or longer you live largely as a, you know, not largely, you live as an elite athlete. And then obviously now you would miss actually playing the game. But my question is more about... Um, it's just more about fitness and just about you had diminishing abilities but you were still really, really fit and then you retire and is that, um, is that something that you, um, that you miss or is that nice to, is that nice to, have, to get to let that go? 
No, I, I don't miss the game. I don't miss playing the game because my knees were shot. They're still sore. When I, if I go for a run, they still ache and they're not in great shape. So I was done with the game physically and emotionally. I'd kind of spent... I, I, I do miss being fit, I must say. I've had a year off. I've been a bit of a slob for a year and I've... I, I, I do miss that. The, you know, there's, a, there's another small chapter in the book about what it's like to feel fit, and I'm even reading it back. Oh, geez, I miss that. Where even wa- when you when you're at peak fitness, even walking is not enough. You feel like you want to break into a run like a greyhound. Um, so I, I, I want to get back there. It's gonna be a long road back. <laughs> well, Bob the. The, the timing device they issued it's is flashing, now flashing, flashing red. ominously. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that means we're over. Yeah. Yeah? I think so. Um, <laughs> so Bob and I are now going to go and sit down the back at little tables that have stocked with books. Um, and um, just to say to you, this is as good a book as he is a bloke. <laughs> and that's saying something. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. <laughs>